If you want to know more about your risk for kidney stones during pregnancy, why they form, how they're diagnosed, and what your options are for treatment, you're going to want to watch this video. Hi, I'm Joey Weichman, and welcome to Stone Relief. So before we dive into this topic any more deeper, I really want to just give you a brief background on the situation with kidney stones during pregnancy. Now, the statistics tell us that about one in every 200 to 1500 women are going to experience this during their pregnancy. Now, on the surface, this doesn't seem like it's that great amount of people. However, it is actually the leading cause of hospital admissions for pregnant women. So it's actually more prevalent than you think. And when it comes to when you might particularly or potentially experience this, it's going to be during your second and third trimesters for most people. Now, if you're coming into pregnancy and you form kidney stones previously, there is a chance that you may see this during your first trimester. However, for most people, and if they've never had a kidney stone before, it's going to occur during your second and third trimester due to some hormonal changes that we'll talk about in another chapter. Now, typically for people, that this is going to present itself as flank pain. And when I say flank pain, this means it's pain occurring along the side, usually in the mid-back, below the ribs, and above the hip. And the reason for this is there's a backup of urine that's occurring due to the obstruction caused by the stone. It's called hydronephrosis. That leads to the blockage that causes the kidney to swell, and that swelling and stretching of the kidney is what leads to that insane level pain. So that is also known as renal colic, and we have a video for this if you want to check that out as well. Now, the other things that you might see when you have a kidney stone is there's going to be blood in the urine, and this is called uh, hematuria. Now, unfortunately, diagnosing kidney stones is a bit of a difficult prospect for most medical professionals, because when you have uh, you know, pregnant woman, there are a whole host of new aches and pains, there's blood in your urine. So you really have to work closely with your medical team to be able to diagnose and determine if it is truly a kidney stone or if it's just typical pregnancy pains with that child growing inside you. So when it comes to what actually forms these stones during pregnancy, if you've never ever had a kidney stone before, it's really primarily driven by a couple of factors, but mostly it's by hormonal changes, which there are no shortage of when you are growing a child inside you. So the biggest one is an increase in something called progesterone. So first impact that this has is that it actually has a fact where it decreases something called the urinary peristalsis. And peristalsis is a contraction and relaxation of smooth muscle tissue throughout your body. And in particular, what we're interested in is the smooth muscle with relation to the urinary tract. So what's it connecting your kidney down to your bladder, then eventually out through your urethra. So when you have a decrease in urinary peristalsis, this means that urine is staying in the kidney longer, and this is a recipe for increased kidney stone formation because kidney stones take time, and then also lithogenic factors such as calcium, oxalate, and phosphate to be in the kidney, again, for a set period of time in order for them to crystallize. So when peristalsis decreases because of progesterone, risk for kidney stones goes up. Next, urinary pH also changes. So progesterone actually increases the pH of urine past neutral, and neutral for most human beings is between a pH of 6.5 and, and a 7.5, with 7 being neutral on the pH scale. So when pH, or when your pH of your urine becomes too alkaline, crystallization actually favors phosphate ions over calcium, or oxalate ions rather. And calcium oxalate stones are the most common type of kidney stone. So even if you come into this equation when you're coming into a pregnancy, with calcium oxalate stones because they are the most common, it is likely that you're gonna switch gears and move over to forming calcium phosphate stones, again, due to the urine pH change because of progesterone. Lastly, many women are taking neonatal supplements, vitamins and minerals, things along those lines. The problem is, is that most of those supplements that are being taken are synthetic in nature, and synthetic vitamins and minerals our body really doesn't recognize them and doesn't know what to do with them. And when your body doesn't know what to do with something, it excretes it as waste. And in this particular instance, especially with calcium supplements or the calcium found in a lot of neonatal supplements, it's just gonna get excreted through your urine. So when we have a combination of these factors, when we have increased calcium presence in the urine, we have a crystallization or urine pH that favors crystallization of calcium and phosphate, we have a recipe for calcium phosphate kidney stones, which are the most prevalent type that pregnant women experience. Just a reminder, this information is available in written form on our website. Find the link below in the description. So you might be asking yourself, 
I'm experiencing some of those pains. How do I go about determining whether it's a kidney stone or if it's just the normal aches and pains and sensations that are happening during my pregnancy? So the first place to start is really with imaging. This is gonna be able to tell us what's happening inside the body. And the first and foremost, the absolute priority is the safety to your unborn child. So this actually rules out a lot of imaging techniques that are traditionally used on people who are not pregnant. So CT scans and x-rays are not safe for the child due to their use of ionizing radiation, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So what are your options? This really boils down to ultrasound, and there are two different types. There is a renal ultrasound where the uh, technician takes a ultrasonic wand and they're gonna put it over the side of your kidney to try to identify a stone in the kidney. And then there's a second option, which is called a transvaginal ultrasound. And this is literally where they're using an ultrasonic wand that is inserted into the vagina. And the reason for this is that if they don't see any kind of stone uh, either up in the kidney or in the ureter as it's traveling down towards your bladder, it's likely that that stone may have migrated or moved all the way down to the distal part of the urinary tract, which is the lower portion of the urinary tract. And you'll know that it's down there when you experience no longer symptoms necessarily up in the kidney region, that insane pain. You might be experiencing some discomfort and some cramping that are occurring down in your abdominal area. And again, this can get really confusing with all the other sensations that are happening during pregnancy, but that is typically a telltale sign of a stone that has made it down to the lower urinary tract. Now, ultrasounds are by far the safest. This is how you learned that you were pregnant in the first place as well, so there's no impact to the unborn child. However, it is very low in accuracy, so it is very tough to see small kidney stones or kidney stones that are hidden behind other tissues in the body, and this makes it even more of a challenge if you are of a higher body mass index or BMI, so you're either overweight or obese, this makes ultrasound even less accurate than before. So what are your options? There is something called a half Fourier single shot turbo spin echo, also known as HASTE, MRU, and that is magnetic resonance urography. And this is extremely accurate. It is almost as accurate as a CT scan. And again, a CT scan uses ionizing radiation and a HASTE MRU uses non-ionizing radiation. And the difference between these two is this. Ionizing radiation is much more powerful. It has the ability to break ionic bonds uh, or the bonds between mo molecules, so molecular bonds. Non-ionizing radiation is not strong enough to do that. However, here are some examples, and you can see where I'm going here, why I said however. Non-ionizing radiation is things like Wi-Fi, radio waves, and also power lines. And if you're anything like me, and chances are, since you landed here on this channel, you're suspect of those things as well. I know that I personally uh, minimize my exposure to things like Wi-Fi. I certainly don't wanna be living underneath power lines, and I'm also really sensitive about non-ionizing radiation that I put around my head and other parts of my body as well. So, proceed with caution. Best bet, deal with your medical team to be able to determine for your unique situation, what the best imaging modality will be. So, if you find yourself being one of those unfortunate women that are actually suffering from a kidney stone during your pregnancy, the next question you're absolutely gonna ask is, well, what options do I have to minimize symptoms and potentially treat the kidney stone as well? So, the first of which is gonna sound way too simple to be effective, but it is actually exceptionally effective, and that is staying hydrated. And when I say staying hydrated, you should really be shooting for anywhere between like 96 to 128 ounces of water per day. That's three liters up to about a gallon. And the reason behind this is that the more hydrated that you are, the more consistently you're gonna be passing urine. And as we talked about in the Why These Stones Form chapter, time is an the essence when it comes to stone formation. Additionally, those lithogenic factors or stone forming factors need to be present in the kidney. However, if you're hydrated and you're urinating frequently, you're passing all of those lithogenic or stone forming metabolites out of your body and you're not allowing time for crystallization. So this is a very, very powerful lever to pull. Now, I don't look like for people to chug water. That is gonna be, if you have a kidney stone, that is a recipe for more pain. The goal is nice, even consistent hydration, roughly eight ounces to 12 ounces per hour during your waking hours. And that's about a cup to about a cup and a half of water per hour. That is not that much, you can do it. And if you're looking for tips on how to manage this or uh, put a strategy in place, 
We have also have a video on that as well that we will link up in a card. Now, if you want to boost your protection from kidney stone formations even further, you can add in things like citrates from lemon or limes. Now, a lot of people will just juice a whole lemon or a lime, put it into the liter of water that they might be drinking during that hour or the course of hours, and that is super effective. However, for some people, uh, that acidity of that juice will eventually start to do some funky things with their teeth and it might erode the enamel. So for those individuals who are more sensitive than that, there are actually freeze-dried lemon or lime juice options in capsule form that are available. Pop a couple capsules, drink your water, and you'll have the same protective effect as you would if you're using actual fresh juice. And the reason behind citrates being so powerful for protection is that citrates actually block the binding of calcium with oxalate and calcium with phosphate. So this is a really good hedge for preventing kidney stones on top of all the water that you need to be drinking throughout your day. Now, if you find yourself in a situation where you already have a kidney stone that's formed and it's a large kidney stone, it's causing a lot of pain, potentially putting your child at risk, they're likely gonna recommend a ureteroscopy. And this is a moderately invasive procedure where they're gonna go up through your urethra, into your bladder, into your ureter, up into the kidney potentially as well, depending upon where that stone is located. And they'll use a laser lithotriptor, which is basically a tool that blasts apart the kidney stone with laser. So this will help the stone break into little fragments or dust, and it will allow it to pass, thus relieving that obstruction and the pain that you're in. However, again, it is moderately invasive. And if you can manage it with water and citrates, highly suggest that you do that. The other option that you might get presented with is a temporary drainage situation because again, the blockage that that stone is causing is what is leading to your pain. So they have to find a way to eliminate the blockage. And a ureteral stent is one simple way that they can do it. This is still invasive. It is gonna go up through your urethra into your bladder, into the ureter and then into the kidney. In essence, it's acting like a drainage straw or drainage pipe from your kidney to allow urine to be able to come down even though there is a stone stuck in the way. So this can be very, very helpful. This is still moderately invasive. The next option though is a little bit more invasive and this is a nephrostomy tube. And there will be certain situations where this is the best option and there's nothing that you can do to avoid that. But what this is is basically they're gonna puncture a hole in your side and then into the kidney itself as well and insert a tube that will allow urine to drain into a bag. And again, this is much, much more invasive than a simple ureteral stent and way more invasive than actually having the ureteroscopy procedure as well. However, there are certain situations that dictate this. Work with your medical team. Lastly, as this is more of a cautionary note, there are some urologists out there that may recommend medical expulsive therapy. And what this is, is a pharmaceutical drug that is designed to help increase the speed of stone passage if it is in the lower urinary tract. Now, this has been tested in animal models and has been deemed safe. And there are really limited tests or trials that have been done on human populations, but nothing widespread yet. So proceed with caution with this. I'm a little bit skeptical of anything pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical just to begin with. However, you may come across this and have a discussion with your urologist. Educate yourself. This is really truly the core of everything that you're doing today. Educating yourself and then also seek advice from your medical professional team and weigh out your options based on your unique situation. Visit our website if you'd like to join a community of people learning to manage their kidney stones naturally. See you in the next video.